So um, the, one dimen the one particle, one Brownian particle system was considered by Frank Knight of the Ray Knight theorem. And I'm going to be talking about a multi-particle version of this system. And then we'll, con we'll uh, consider what happens as the number of, of these Brownian particles go to infinity. OK? So um, just uh, to give you guys a, a quick simulation of what this would look like. Um, so we have like these Brownian particles, and we have this in one dimension, and we have this, uh, this massive barrier right here, OK? So something of that form, OK? Um, OK. So we're going to denote the Brownian particles as xi, x1 up through xn, and yn as our massive barrier. Okay? So all the Brownian particles, we're going to have them start with an initial condition at z. Um, this can be generalized. And uh, so the, the velocity of this massive barrier is proportional to the average local time of contact between the, the Brownian particles with the massive barrier. OK? Um, and we're beginning the massive barrier at 0. So this constant of proportionality, which controls uh, the interaction, the strength of the interaction of the impulse, is going to be modeled, is going to be called k, non-negative. Um, OK. So in terms of modeling this stochastically, uh, we have a filtered probability space that supports uh, n Brownian motions. And the xi are going to be, well, they're going to start at z, and they're going to have this Brownian portion. But then they're also going to have this, this uh, li here, which is uh, the local time. Um, and that's going to dominate yn, OK? So the li are non-decreasing and flat off of the contact set with the massive barrier, which means that this l only increases when the massive barrier contacts any one of these particles, OK? Um, dy is going to be the average of this local time, of all these local times. And there's k, OK? Negative, OK, so it's negative. Um, and, and they're all continuous, continuous and adapted. All right, so this is a, a system, all right? This is a system of stochastic processes, and it exists, um, strong existence and uniqueness. So it exists strongly in the sense that if you give me any probability space that supports n Brownian motions, I can exhibit such a solution on that filtered probability space. All right, that's what strong solution means. Um, so the empirical process, at some point in time, we have this collection of particles spread out, distributed through the real line. And we're going to place point masses out on all of them and look at the, uh, so the, the empirical process. OK, so you all know what that is. Um, and so this, at it, each point in time, the empirical process, so at a fixed time, the empirical process is a, is a measure on the real line, right? And so we're going to put a metric on the space of probability measures, and we're going to use the Wasserstein p metric. Okay. Um, and therefore, when you look at the joint process of this empirical uh, process with the ba with the barrier, uh, this is continuous. So it's continuous adapted to the filtration, and it takes values in the space, and it also induces a distribution. So therefore, it induces a distribution on, um, on the space of continuous uh, functions from this interval to the product space. Okay. All right, so the goal of this hydrodynamic limit thing is to basically characterize this limiting distribution as the number of particles goes to infinity. Um, so. I'm going to write down several uh, equations. Well, actually, no. no. I'm going to talk about a little bit of history. So like I said, the origin construction with one Brownian particle began with Frank Knight. 
okay, where he did one, he, so he did one Brownian particle, and then he studied the velocity process, uh, uh, the velocity of the inner particle, of the massive barrier. Um, David White, in 2007, um, came up with the score hood map construction for, which is uh, more general. Birdsey, Bass, Chen, and Herr uh, proved a stationary distribution for, for an analog, for the d-dimensional analog. And in this talk, I'm going to be discussing the uh, this hydrodynamic limit and the, the, the multi multiple particle, uh, multiple Brownian particle analog of this. All right. So here's here's the theorem statement. Um, you know, when you're proving a hydrodynamic limit, it's so in this case we're going to uh, approach a um, solution to a free boundary problem. Okay. And so this, if you've heard of the Stefan problem, this is similar to the Stefan problem. The Stefan problem models the melting of ice. Okay. Uh, but we have these, uh, this interaction here. So I'm, I'm just copying. Whoops. I don't, know. I don't know what that is. Okay, so when x is greater than yt, so what is this? This is just the, the standard heat, um, the, the, the way heat propagates through, through space. And then we have this one-sided um, one -sided derivative. Which, which basically says that on the side where the heat is located of, of the barrier, um, we have this relationship here. Okay. And uh, the limit PTX uh, as time goes to zero is going to be delta z dx. Okay, so this is going to be the first three, and I'm going to call this star. But then we're going to add a condition on y now. So the, the condition on y is that its derivative, or second derivative rather, is, is proportional to its temperature. Okay? So, so this one, with with this condition, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call that cross. Okay. So, um, just a little bit of, of what this would look like. It, it essentially means that. Uh, if here, here's y of t, it's my insulating barrier. And at a given time, I have my uh, distribution, my temperature distribution, p. And p t moves in the sense that its acceleration is proportional to, OK, its temperature. OK. So the hydrodynamic limit statement is that the joint process of the the empirical process with the with the barrier uh, converges to this the pair of, the, of this solution okay where this is the law um, in the Prokhorov of metric so we glean that sense on this space and then the propagation of chaos is the usual statement that if I tag a finite number of fixed particles um, then they converge to a jointly independent um, part processes, which in this case reflect are reflecting Brownian motions from this uh, limiting function y. So I do want to want want to point out some th subtle things with this um, with this solution here. So it's a free boundary problem, which means that we need to solve for p and y together. Okay. So this is nonlinear, 
It's not a linear PDE free boundary problem. Now, if you fix a Y and then you try to solve for P, it's linear, right? So we want to solve for Y and P together. All right, well, um, so I'm not going to be talking about all the different proofs. Um, what I, and to construct the process, we use the score code construction. And then we prove estimates on the score hood map that allow us to demonstrate the hydrodynamic limit, okay? But what I want to talk about is the PDE side because this is a, a really cute uniqueness proof for this, for this PDE, free boundary problem. So if I give you any C, if you give me any C2 function, real valued function, and any Brownian motion, and you just, you define the running minimum, so how far this Brownian motion uh, beginning at Z passes below this, this C2 function, and I just, you know, add it to the Brownian motions in the sense so that I'm always staying above this C2 curve. Well, um, you can use a Gersonov transformation to show that this has the same law as a process as reflected Brownian motion, Brownian motion reflecting from this curve. Okay, but not really, right? Because then you could say, what's your definition of Brownian motion reflecting from a curve? Okay, right? I mean, what's your definition of Brownian motion? So you could look at um, Dominic's blog about Brownian motion reflecting from zero, but you can just take absolute value of Brownian motion, right? And you can define that. But it, but it turns out, so there's several notions, but the score hood map is the most general. In fact, you can even reflect Brownian motion off of like measurable curves, okay? But we need C2 here because X has a transition density. If we assume C2 curve, C, uh, X will have a transition density that will solve this, th this star here. So, so the first three parts. And you can further prove that the temperature of the insulator, Y, at time T, well, which is by definition P, T, Y, T, is going to be one half the typical uh, running minimum. So to prove uniqueness then, uh, well, it suffices to prove uniqueness of such a, of such a Y, because if I fix Y, I can just use a, a like an entropy argument or, or a maximum principle type argument to prove uniqueness for P. If I'm given two uh, solutions of the entire, with this condition on Y here, then the maximum distance between Y1 and Y2, the derivatives, is gonna be less than or equal to, okay, so you can just do this, this step's easy. And then by definition of, of this, Right here, we get P1, and we get, oh, huh, that should be P, that, that shouldn't be a Y2, that should be P2. <laughs> and this is equal to, by the previous proposition, just the expected value of the maximums. But you couple them, right? So you couple them so that they have the same Brownian motion. But now you can get another upper bound based on the maximum gap of, of, the, act, of the two uh, C of the two solutions, right? But then, once you have this, just integrate both sides, and then you have uh, the maximum distance between the two uh, solutions to this problem is going to be, you know, less than or equal to. So, what you'll get something like the maximum distance y1, y2s is going to be less than or equal to k over 2. Uh, t squared um, maximum distance between right like this s in zero t something like that. But then, okay, this means that they must be the same up to a fixed positive value of t. Okay, so they agree on this small interval. Now you just repeat this argument. Okay? Um, there was one, there's a couple useful things that I learned on this project that you guys might find helpful. 
One was a paper that was written by Barlow and Yor in the 80s. So if you have a semi-martingale, continuous semi-martingale, say, and you let LTA be the local time at level A, then if I take the supremum over all levels, right, I take the supremum over all levels at time t, then this has a finite moment. Um, of this form, so that's kind of nice. But also, this was extended by Bass. So look up LP inequalities for functionals of Brownian motion. Okay, obrigado. So done. Uh, Mauricio?